So, Father, we ask that you would come and that you would teach us your word and that you would uh, bless us as we learn and as we are built up in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we've got nine studies that, uh, that we're doing. It's not nine weeks, it's ten weeks because we're having a week off for July the 5th uh, for those of you that love to uh, spend time with your families. And so our topic this time is growing faith in God. Anyone here want to grow their faith in God? I know I do. I learn as much from these as uh, the teacher always learns the most. (laughs) So the more I get my head together to write these studies, the more I'm learning. And of course, I've written it uh, many years ago and and improving them. Hopefully, I'm improving them. the, you're the only one that can tell me whether it's improved or not. So tonight, our, our, our topic for this particular class is increase our faith. Increase our faith. And of course, that's based on a passage in Scripture where the disciples ask Jesus, and we'll get into that in a minute. So um, what comes to mind when you think of the word faith? Maybe assurance, maybe hope, maybe confidence. And these things are all connected to faith, but faith that's unconnected to a source is wishful thinking. (laughs) We, We have to have faith in the right source for the kind of faith that we're hoping to build in our lives. It's like the sign, I don't know whether you've seen it, I've, I've got a relative that's uh, got a sign up on their wall, have faith. And I think, well, it's more than just having faith. Some people believe that, that faith is, is like some kind of psychic tool to achieve their aims, that if they just have faith, it'll, everything will work. But no, it's not faith in faith. You've got to have faith in the right source. And of course, the the source for us as believers in Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, God himself. We want to have faith in God. And um, what I want to experience as I study this topic, as I write, as I teach, uh, is to experience faith. And I want that for you as well, the listeners and the readers. Uh, I want for each of us to grow together in our faith. Our faith in the one who has written that he can move mountains. Now, God can move literal mountains, but I think in most cases, the mountains he's talking about are them immovable situations in life that we run into and it seems like nothing will move it. You pray and you pray and you pray and you, you wonder, well, this is like a mountain against me. But God can move spiritual mountains and yeah, he's well able to move a physical mountain if he wants to as well. So Jesus told us that we could have this faith in God. He encouraged us to walk in it knowing the source, the power source is critical to faith. Here is the essence of faith, our first passage of scripture found in Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Do you want to please God? God is pleased by faith faith in him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The fact that you are here makes me greatly encouraged because I know you're a seeker after God and that pleases him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So my desire for you and me is that we all grow in faith and approach this topic with expectation. One person has said 
those very words, that faith is expectation. What are you expecting God to do? Faith isn't believe that God will do something. Faith isn't that God can, can do something. Faith is in that God will do something. It's in expectation. Are you expecting God to move in your situation as you learn how to walk in faith? We will experience the joy that comes by faith. Answered prayer. I do not believe that faith is to be complicated. God's want, God wants to grow us in our, in our faith and that is his will. So this topic of faith, in my opinion, is an important one for the days that we are in already and the days that are yet ahead. In my opinion, America is facing a time of persecution, I hope. I'm wrong about that. But I see lots of signs, and maybe you see the same signs, that faith is being relegated and pushed out into the corner. In the West, we have not experienced trials and persecution to the same level that our brothers and sisters are experiencing all over the world. But when trials and persecution happen, you will need to trust God as you've never trusted him before. The scriptures teach in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that uh, we will be tested and that many will fall away. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Now when you read that passage, there are three different ways the word falling away is rendered. And in one translation, it's the word rebellion. In another translation, it's the word apostasy. Many will apostatize at some point in the future. We must start to prepare for those days now, not when they're on us, because we'll need to learn how to build up our faith and practice our faith. Faith in God is like like a body muscle growing as we use it. You ever thought of faith as a muscle? <laughs> the more you use it, the more you step out in it, the more and the stronger your faith will become. Remember the five wise virgins uh, that were waiting for the bridegroom, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25. Remember the five foolish virgins, the mistake they made was that they didn't prepare ahead of time. They were unprepared to face the darkness. They, the five wise virgins had extra oil for their lamps. They prepared ahead of time. And the five foolish virgins did not prepare. And they were all of a sudden shocked that they had to try and find extra oil when the Lord came. So one of the most important things that the disciples ever asked Jesus was how should they grow in their faith? This is what they said to him. Increase our faith. Luke 17 verse 5. So I, when I talk about such things, I, I always like to use stories and some of you like stories. A good fisherman always tells a good story, right? <laughs> and I'm still a fisherman at the heart. I want to use my nets to catch the souls of God. I used to catch Dover souls in my younger years, and the Lord called me away from that and said, oh, I've got better souls for you to catch. <laughs> so anyway, let's, uh, I, I, I'd like to give you a real-life example of a man that exhibited great faith. And we'll get into the scriptures and look at examples next, next week, but I wanted you to see someone that's inspired me in my faith, a man by the name of George Mueller. Anyone ever heard of him? George Mueller, a few of you have. George Mueller, and we're going to talk about an example of faith now. George Mueller was born in Prussia, Eastern Europe, in the year 1805. 
and he died in 1898 at 93 years of age. He grew up a very ungodly man, and he often stole from his father and his friends. So his early years were that of a drunk and a worldly-minded man. Now and then he, he got a guilty conscience, and he tried to change his ways, and he knew deep inside that his, his life of sin was displeasing to God. But again and again, he could not change his lifestyle. It was habitual. And uh, it was just full of deception, theft, drunkenness, until one night one of his drinking buddies told him of something that he did on a Saturday night. In his own words, Mueller said this, and I quote, One Saturday afternoon, about the middle of November 1825, I took a walk with my friend Beta. On our return, he told me that he was in the habit of going on Saturday evenings to the house of a Christian house group. There you go. There you go. House groups come changing lives again and again. The house of a Christian where there was a meeting. He told me they read the Bible, sang, prayed, and read a printed sermon on further inquiry. No sooner had I heard this, but it was to me as if I had found something after which I had been seeking all my life long. I immediately wished to go with my friend, who was, at, who was not at once willing to take me. <laughs> For knowing me, a merry young man, he thought I should not like this meeting. At last, however, he said he would call for me. When he got to the meeting, he met a man named Kesa, who afterward became a missionary to Africa. And Kesa asked for God's blessing upon the meeting while praying on his knees. I quote again, This kneeling down made a deep impression on me, said Mueller. The meeting was composed of a hymn at the beginning, a chapter from the Bible, and a printed sermon. The time together ended with another hymn. And in speaking about the experience of reading and meditating on Scripture with a group of godly folk, he said, I was happy. Though if I had been asked why I was happy, I could not clearly have explained it. That evening was the turning point in his life. He said, whether I fell on my knees when I returned home, I do not remember. But this much I know. I lay peaceful and happy in my bed. I do not doubt that on that evening, God began a work of grace in me, though I obtained joy with any, without any deep sorrow of heart and with scarcely any knowledge. The first four years of his life were somewhat uneventful, but in July 1829, he came into an entire and complete surrender of his heart. He writes, and again I quote, I gave myself fully to the Lord, honors, pleasures, money, and my physical powers, my mental powers, all were laid down at the feet of Jesus. And I became a great lover of the word of God. I found my all in God, and my faith is not merely exercise regarding temporal things, but also everything, because I cleave to the Word. My knowledge of God and His Word is what helps me. So what did he do? After a few years of learning to trust God by hearing Him speak and acting upon it, God led him to begin an orphanage with only two shillings, which is about 50 cents. <laughs> Starting an orphanage with 50 cents seems crazy, right? He committed to God that he would never ask for money. And any time the needs were not, meant, not met, he would take it as a sign that God no longer needed the work. 
Through faith and just the strength of his prayer life, Mueller would pray in all the needs for a work that became five large orphanages, buildings of sizable solid granite that, before he died, met the requirements of no less than 10,000 orphans. 2,000 at any one time. At 29, he started the Scripture Knowledge Institution for Home and Abroad. Its purpose was to aid Christian day schools, assist missionaries, and circulate the Scriptures. This institution, without worldly patronage, committees, subscribers, or memberships, but through faith in the Lord alone, had obtained and dispersed no less a sum than one and a half million pounds. Such an amount of money was an astronomical sum for the time he was living, especially considering that the invoice of the 14-ton bell called Big Ben, that bell that rings in the Houses of Parliament, 14 ton, when that was put in place in the Houses of Parliament, it cost 572 pounds. <laughs> and here he was, the Lord was given him one and a half million pounds at that time, 1958. The bulk of this enormous sum, sum was spent on the orphanage. He sometimes would gather the children and pray with them about their needs. Sometimes mealtime was almost at hand and they did not know where their food would come from. But God always had it in hand. One time they played the, prayed the blessing over the food, even though there was none on the table. They literally had all the kids around the table, prayed the blessing over the empty plates. And just as they finished the prayer, there was a knock on the door and somebody arrived with loads of food. And he apologized that he was running a bit late. <laughs> That is faith. <laughs> Would you have done that? Would you have prayed over, over empty plates like that, trusting that God knew what he was doing? So God never let them down in all those years of praying and trusting God. 600 pounds a week were required to support the orphans at the time of Mueller's death. Yet the Lord sent them daily, bread day by day. So here's a question. Get your processing. What could George Mueller's faith in God be attributed to? Was this faith that he had a gift of God? Or did he cultivate a life of prayer and faith? What you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. What do I mean about that? When I consider the life of George Mueller, it makes me wonder to myself, well, what was his secret? I believe that in times of need, God does give a gift of faith. There's an impartation of a gift of faith for you to believe something that normally would be impossible for you to believe. But also, there's the fruit of faith that comes to a person. And that fruit has to be cultivated. So God never leaves you uh, without an ability to draw on his power through faith. A gift imparted or faith that's cultivated through a life of devotion and prayer and scripture reading. When, uh, when I think of his secret, I think a secret of George Mueller's faith was his worldview. Now, if you're not familiar with that word, let me explain about a worldview. A worldview consists of underlying assumptions and images that provide a lens through which we view the world. Perhaps as you look back over your life, you recall 
the school that you grew up in, which taught you that there is nothing beyond death and that there is no God and that man came about by chance. Those thoughts and assumptions about the world form your worldview and perception of how the world operates. How we see the world we live in will affect how we live. We need a paradigm shift, a change in our, our awareness of the world and how it operates. George Mueller had a biblical worldview, which all God's people need to have as a lens to view the world. Scripture puts it like this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's our worldview change, our paradigm shift that Scripture is explaining to us. Don't, don't conform any longer to that pattern that was inputting your life as a child. No. As you grow older in the Lord Jesus Christ, your worldview, the way you look at the world, needs to change to a biblical worldview, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Humanity is in the middle of a spiritual war, and I'm sure you're aware of that. If you're not aware of that, then you need to look further at what is going on in the world. And we are being shaped and conformed to a worldview that is promoted to us on every side with ideas that conflict and contradict the Word of God. Satan is called the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Think about that. He's the ruler? What do you mean? The, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the scripture says. So how come Satan is called the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient? There are people placed in all areas of this world that are disobedient, to the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the enemy is at work to fashion you, to brainwash you, to use that word, to mold you into an image that is far from the image of God. When we understand that a godless and faithless worldview is broadcast to us 24-7, it is clear that we are under a great pressure to conform to a worldview that excludes God and the concept of trusting Him. We are being manipulated, brothers and sisters, to conform to this world's standards. And we must be aware of, the, of what is influencing our thoughts for the better or for the worse. And we need a wake-up call to view the world differently and see that we're under attack through all kinds of media that's bombarding us day in, day out. Nothing but conformity to Jesus can overcome conformity to the world system. Living a life of faith is challenging if we see the world only in the way that we have been programmed to by our upbringing and schooling. In our thought life, day by day, we are confronted with a choice of worldviews to live by. This world's values or God's values? If we do not know the Word of God, we will be unable to think according to the Scriptures. And it will be challenging to live a life of faith in God. Let me show you some drawings as an example of how we see something affected 
by previous data input. You've probably already seen this drawing, but what do you see? What do you see there? Most people will see a beautiful young woman in the drawing. The next picture gives us, or the next drawing gives us a sharper picture. What do you see in the next picture? The chances are that many of you will see a more refined picture of the young woman. And some people can see an older woman in the drawing. Can you see the older woman? Now scroll down to the third drawing. How many of you can't see the old woman? Now, now you can see her lines better, right? Can you see the old woman now? The example is how, how input can conform us to just a pattern of thinking along certain lines when there's another way of looking at things. If one were to put up the first drawing on a, on a PowerPoint slide and only allow half the room to view the first drawing and the other half to be shown the third drawing, the place would be split into an argument where those half of the side would just see the young person, the other half would just see the old person, and there'd be an argument. It is difficult to shake from your mind what you have been programmed to see by the first picture. Anyone still unable to see the old person? It's difficult to throw that first picture out of your mind. <laughs> I can see some vague faces that are still hard, having a hard time in trying to find the old woman. <laughs> so, what you see is a result of your conditioning. If 10 seconds can determine what you see in that drawing, imagine how a lifetime of knowledge and experience affects your perception and worldview. Our old life and the data input from our childhood affects us to such a degree that that is only the way that we look at the world. But there is another way. When you have your eyes opened by the Spirit of God, uh, you begin to look at the world through a different lens, the lens of Scripture, which is the true reality, not what we are being propagandized to see by our upbringing. A world, they tell us, with no God, we're just nothing, and, uh, and we're going nowhere, and when you die, that's it. That is all a lie from the pit of hell. And we are to view reality which is there in the scriptures. So, another question. In what way do you think modern life is shaping your worldview to conform to its standard? How has life changed, for example, in the last 100 years? Go for it. I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. Let's move on. Considering George Mueller's great measure of faith, which changed not only his life, but the lives of thousands of people, it is clear that his worldview was shaped by his belief in the promises of God's word and that God would provide not only for his need, but the orphans he cared for as well. George Mueller became a, became a great man of God uh, by changing his worldview to a biblical one, formed by his love for the scriptures. Did you notice the two things he said about himself? He said that he gave himself entirely to the Lord, one, and two, and the knowledge of the word of God. What this world tells us to do contradicts the word of God and what the Lord would have us to believe. There is an invisible world that intersects this world and uh, the Lord, who is a spirit, John 
4, verse 24, longs for his people to ask him to work on their behalf. You have not because you ask not, James said. Those who are connected to him by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they find that those who are connected to him find that uh, there is a flow to their belief, their faith, as they input their lives by the word of God. God has no favorites. And what he did for George Mueller, he wants to do for each of us. Now, although God has different gifts and callings for all of his children, he wants all of us to live a life of faith, faith in him. Scripture says this, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What does that mean? It says that God looks over the whole world. Imagine that. He can see all things at all times. He knows everyone. He knows how many hairs there are on your head or how many there isn't on your head. He knows your thoughts even before you think them. And he's looking for those whose heart is fully committed that says, Lord, no longer I, but you. I want you to live your life through me. And he's looking at each of us and our willingness to walk with him by faith. When he sees evidence that your heart is fully committed to him, he comes alongside to strengthen and help you. He has work for each of us to do. Why? Because we are all called to be kingdom builders, God's kingdom builders. This work is accomplished through his power, working in us and through us by faith. To live a life of faith, we must have a heavenly perspective, a biblical worldview. Which leads us to a big question. What what is faith? Faith is, in the spiritual realm, what money is in the commercial realm. Anonymous. Found that somewhere. Couldn't attribute who it was, though. Alexander McLaren said this, faith is the sight of the inward eye. I like that. There's an inner part to us that sees things by faith, separate from the world of the eyes. Are you with me? Webster's New World Dictionary uses words such as confidence, Belief, to be convinced of, reliance, or complete trust. The Greek word that's often used that's translated faith is the word pistis, which Strong's Biblical Dictionary defines as, quote, persuasion, giving credence to someone, the moral conviction of religious truth. We are saying that God comes to that faith comes to people when they give credence or trust that God is speaking to them through His Word. What does the Scripture say? Consequently, Romans ten verse seventeen. Consequently, Paul writes, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. We could paraphrase that, and one translation does paraphrase it as saying that faith comes from hearing God speak and hearing God speak through the word of God. The more one feeds their mind with God's thoughts, the more faith will grow in a person's heart. Let's use an example of a computer. That's more... Up front and personal. Most of us use computers every day, right? If data is never loaded onto the internet for you to access, how will you be able to use the internet? 
At one time, software programs had to be loaded onto your computer. Most of us remember those days, remember? We had to put a disk in the side. You notice there's no disk you had to put in the side of your laptop any longer. No, they got rid of the disks. They want you all accessing the data that's there on the internet. But if no one inputs the data onto the in internet, how are you going to access it? What are we talking about? Nowadays, cloud computing has taken over. The data is all there for us to access with an internet connection. What we're saying is that faith in God comes as we grow in the knowledge of God's thoughts expressed in the word of God, the data of God that we are to access and use. But of course, the word of God is more than just data. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. They're more than just data. The word of God is living and active. Wow. Oh, we wish I had time to go there. One person might say, I wish I had faith. I don't have any faith, they would say. But God says that everyone has been given a measure of faith. Here's the word of God, Romans 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has dealt like a pack of cards. He's dealt out to every one of us a measure of faith. We use faith every day. We just don't realize it. Have you ever been to a doctor or a dentist? Well, you're, you're exercising your confidence in the doctor or the dentist by allowing them to work on your body or on your teeth, whatever. All of us have faith. When, you, when people get on an airplane, you put a lot of faith in that mechanic or that pilot. You don't even see the pilot, but you trust that he's up there. You trust that he's been well-trained to do what he does. And that's a lot of faith to go thousands of feet up in the air. Well, God wants us to trust in his character and in his word. Think of the trust that you place in people daily. When you think of it like that, why do we have difficulty trusting God? This is where our worldview becomes apparent. God is asking you to place your trust and complete reliance on him. He said this, Mark 10, 15. I tell you the truth, and whenever anything is prefaced by I tell you the truth, he's saying, listen clearly, listen clearly what I'm about to tell you. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. What? I remember when my son, Simeon, he's 30 years old now. <laughs> but I remember the days when in England I would stand him up on the kitchen worktop and I would open my arms and I would say, come on, jump into me, jump onto me. He never once looked down and thought to himself, well, Dad, that's a long way down. You sure you're going to catch me? No, no. He, he, every time he launched out, into my arms, knowing that, knowing my character, knowing that I would not drop him, he trusted that I was well able to catch him. Your heavenly father wants you to act like a little child in that respect, that you will trust him. As we already have seen, faith grows in the use of it. Believe in God for small things and see answers. 
And you then have faith for the next steps, for bigger and bigger things. Are you learning to trust God at all times? If you are, then when hard times come, our trust in God will be easier. After all, God is not limited. Any limits placed on us are due to our lack of understanding and our low expectations. Since we have all been dealt a measure of faith, the problem is not growing the receptacle, but adding knowledge and stepping out in obedience to what you know of God's character and word. Let's look now at what Jesus said, this whole context of increase our faith. Let's look at the whole passage of Scripture and try and understand what the Lord was saying and what the disciples' question was all about, the context. Verse 5 of what was the passage we're in. We've got to turn to the other side. Luke 17, 5 to 10. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. How do we understand? What on earth is Jesus talking about when, he, when the disciples want to understand about increasing their faith? Why is he talking about servants preparing dinner for their master? We have to go back in the context. Now, we won't have time to go into the whole context, but let me just tell you, the context of the passage comes after Jesus' radical statement that a disciple of Christ is to forgive his brother seven times in one day if he turns and repents. The rabbi said that if a person forgave another three times, he was a perfect man. Jesus advocated that his people are to go a long way further than the rest of the world. The chief antagonists of the Lord was the elders and the Pharisees. And uh, the disciples were not to be bitter and resentful towards the Pharisees for their opposition and their critical attitudes towards them. The disciples' response to the statement was that Wow, we need extra faith if we're going to, if we have to forgive them to that degree, we've got to have more faith. Lord, increase our faith, please help us. And the Lord says that it's not about their size, the size of their faith or ours. Our faith can be small as a mustard seed, he says, one of the smaller seeds. It's more about what we do with the measure of faith we have. It is acting out of obedience to our master's wishes based on our knowledge of him and his will. They were to see themselves as servants doing everything the master said to do, whether it's plowing the fields or making the supper. Faith grows out of obedience to live out what we know about the Lord's character and his will, and this will produce good things, good fruit, from the outflow of our lives. I think it would be helpful if I use uh, the analogy of Charles Cooper in his excellent book, Fight 
flight or faith. The book aims to show Christians how to survive dark times and hard times, dark days. Charles encourages us to think about faith as an empty pie dish in the book. We don't grow the pie dish. We add to the pie dish the ingredients for the pie, which he views as knowledge or newly acquired information. I quote from his book. The container that holds the pie and gives it shape is faith. Knowledge is the content of the pie. Each slice is an individual truth or conviction that we acquire on the way of life. The container does not grow or get any larger. It remains the same. The number of pieces in the pie changes relative to what one believes about a given issue. The Bible describes the number of slices a particular person has regarding any particular issue as that of unbelief, little faith, or great faith, which is what we'll look at next week. At any time in your life, you are either in a trial, going into a trial, or coming out of a trial. <laughs> God is committed to building your character through your life experiences. And each test is a lesson on using another piece of the pie. In one place, the Apostle Peter writes this. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. Notice that he's saying, look, add knowledge to your faith. What knowledge of God do you have that you can put to use in whatever trial of your faith you come into? God is at work in your lives giving us experiential knowledge. That's a big word, isn't it? Knowledge is not just data input into your brain. No, God is giving you experiential knowledge as well as head knowledge. What do I mean by experiential knowledge? When you act upon a truth, when you walk in something new and you come to the realization that God keeps his word and he answers a particular prayer for you and you're amazed and you say, wow, Lord, you really are wonderful. <laughs> and I'm sure he laughs and says, well, it's about time you trusted me for that particular issue. What then happens is you have that as an experiential truth. What, I'm, what am I talking about? There are people that I know that have car faith. What do I mean by that? They have faith that whatever the situation with their car, they can believe God for another car. And either the Lord will provide them enough money or God will provide them a car. I've met people that have had given to them car after car as they've stepped out in faith. And it's because God has shown them that he is well and true according to his word. Knowledge is more than head knowledge. It is a piece of knowledge that is experienced. Here's what Ephesians 2 verse 10 says. Paul writes, For we are God's workmanship. I love that, workmanship. In other words, God is working on you. He's molding you. He's shaping you to be someone. Day by day, year by year, you are going through all kinds of trials, tests, and he is expanding your faith and your trust you often just don't realize him that he's working. But here, back to our scripture. Let's explain it. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. What? You mean to say God has prepared ahead of time? Experiences throughout my life to grow me into the person he wants me to be. I'm doing things today which, if you'd have told me 30 years or 40 years ago, I'd have said, yeah, you're crazy, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but God adds faith the more you step out and say, Lord, I think you're leading me to do this. I trust that you're leading me to do this, and you go and do it. Then all of a sudden, wow, Lord, you are true to your word. You've taken me to that next level level. I hate using that term, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it sensible. <laughs> Think of it. The works you have done and are doing have been prepared for you ahead of time for you to walk in. God has more work planned for you. I trust that you're not going home yet. I, I trust that there are more works that God has ahead for you and for me. I think he's keeping me around because he wants me to do more things. It's more works that I am to step out in. Do these works have anything to do with our level of faith or our expectation of God? I think so. In light of this, consider what you want to believe God for. Let's have another question. What would you want people to remember about your life when you are gone? <laughs> Very sobering thought, I know. What would you want them to remember as your most significant accomplishment? Go for it. I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. You can be as private as you want about that or as vulnerable as you want. Up to you. So what we're saying is that every trial that we go through is filtered through the hands of a loving and sovereign God. He has allowed every trial or situation to come into your life to teach you to walk by faith and use the knowledge you have gained about his word and character, a pie filled with bits of information about him. Information, what do we mean, information? Knowledge of God, his word, and his character. Before God created the world, he had an idea of the finished product of each of us studying these words. Here's what the scriptures say. Philippians 1 verse 6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Whatever trial you find yourself going through right now, reach out and hold on to a promise in God's word. Pray it back to him. Remind him of it. Lord, you said... I often say that to, to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you said, and it's based on the word of God. God is true to his word. It is impossible, the scriptures say, for God to lie. He watches over his word to perform it. And what does that mean? It means you trust him for that particular word to be completed in you then he watches over his word to fulfill it. When Jesus faced trials and temptation by Satan in the wilderness, did you notice that the Lord used a piece of the pie in faith? What am I talking about? His knowledge of God and his word to each temptation, the Lord responds with the word of God, it is said. He could have just spoken what he wanted to, for what issues out of his lips is the word of God. <laughs> After all, he is God and his word is true. 
But to be an example to you and me, Jesus quoted from God's word, which became a living, a direct living word to the situation he faced. This kind of word comes alive for the situation at hand. We call it a rhema word. You ever heard that word before? The Greek word rhema, what does it mean? It's a specific word for a particular circumstance. For illustration purposes, we will call this a piece of pie in the pie dish of faith. This Greek word, rhema, is used in Ephesians 6, verse 17, where we are told to take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And the Greek word there is rhema, the specific Word of God that God will drop into your heart for that situation. We are to take up the sword of the Spirit, the rhema Word of God, for the situation at hand. Sometimes this word may not be in Scripture. It may be a simple witness in your heart about something you have asked God to do for you, and you sense a yes from God in your spirit. However, a rhema word will always align with the Scriptures, the written word. That is why we must gain an understanding of and knowledge of the Word of God and how it relates to our faith. Here's what John the Apostle wrote, 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. This is the confidence, I like that, confidence. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will... He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If we know and can be confident that what we are asking for is under God's will and is what he wants to do, we can view ourselves as partners with him, just carrying out the very thing he wants us to do on earth. We bring the reality of the kingdom of God into our lives on earth. The rhema word is always specific to the situation, a word that the Spirit of God inspires. Let me use an example. Perhaps, and again I say perhaps, we don't know for sure whether this is what happened, but this is what I believe took place with Nathaniel also called Bartholomew. He was moved very quickly by Jesus from a state of unbelief to faith within minutes. Let's read the passage where it talks about his experience of meeting the Lord Jesus, as found in John chapter 1, verses 45 to 50. Philip found Nathanael. There's our man, Nathanael. He, and told him, we have found the one. Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? <laughs> I say it like I think he said it, you know. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? It obviously, it was not known as a very faithful place. <laughs> Hicksville, <laughs> we might say. Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you. While you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. 
what? How did this guy come from such scorn to a place of, you're the son of God? I'll tell you what I believe, whether it witnesses to you or not. It was Jesus speaking a word that only God could have known. We would probably call it a word of knowledge today. It was more than likely a prayer that Nathaniel had prayed while alone with God sitting under the fig tree. We can only guess based on what we see here, but I believe Nathaniel was enjoying just one-on-one time with God while sitting under the fig tree, perhaps asking God if he knew him, Lord, do you really see me? Do you really take into account my life? Lord, here I am sitting under this fig tree and I don't know anything about you. Oh God, do you really see my life? And when he met Jesus and Jesus said to him, I saw you while you were under the fig tree, ah, all of a sudden he realized God was listening to me and what I said. We don't know whether that was exactly what he prayed, but something sparked in his heart when he saw that Jesus knew exactly what he was seeing while under the fig tree. Plus, he read his character. Notice that? It was a piece of the pie in his pie dish of faith. God was watching him and he knew what was in his heart, that he had nothing false, and he saw him under the fig tree. Experiential pieces of knowledge in the pie dish of faith gave Nathaniel evidence to trust him for things not yet seen. What about Thomas? Remember Thomas? That disciple was moved in such a way to faith. He was not in the upper room when the other disciples saw Jesus enter their midst. And when he heard about it later, he would not believe it. Only when Jesus came to him personally and showed him the nail prints on his hands and feet did Thomas believe. His faith didn't get bigger. He was given experiential knowledge to apply to his faith. He fell on his knees saying, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Seeing is not believing. Seeing is seeing. Believing is being confident without seeing, G. Campbell Morgan once said. Sense evidence, such as Thomas was given, is a beautiful thing to add to our pie dish of faith. But we are more blessed if we believe and act upon our trust in the character of God and his word Just like George Mueller, that was the secret of his faith. His worldview was one of trust in his heavenly Father and in his resources. The Word of God mixed with faith is a powerful weapon in the life of a Christian. And it will bring great fruit to your life. The more you exercise it, the more you step out, Remember that you don't have to drum up an extraordinary measure of faith. Take the measure of faith that you have and mix it with God's word. And you can connect to faith, faith in God, more significant than your own. Faith that comes from God, nothing is too hard for him. By faith you will connect with the extraordinary, the all-sufficient one. Let's pray. Can you stand with me? Father, thank you 
for giving to each of us a measure of faith. Please help us to use that faith that you've given us. Help us to mix it with the Word of God. Help us to uh, input our lives with the data of the Word of God so that whatever situation we face, you will speak your word, remind us of your word, and we can put it into action. Trust in you. Lord, increase our faith, we pray you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.